Chapter 23, The Rescue One morning I yawned awake, climbed the mound, and stared out to sea. The rising sun was a fiery ball balancing upon the rim of the sea. Soon it would grow steadier but far smaller as it concentrated on its daily job of lighting half the world. My heart suddenly beat, almost painfully, floating out of the haze around distant Cape Melville. It was a snow-white mainsail, small as the wing of a gull. But it was a sail, and on that tack, and with the wind as it was, it was heading directly towards the island. It was on the Cooktown tack, heading south. I watched with beating heart. There was only the faintest breeze if it did not strengthen. The vessel would hardly get here by sunset. With a strengthening wind, she would try to make Coquet her night anchorage. I felt certain of it. She was on direct tack. Pearling luggers bound for Cooktown to discharge pearl shell and take in stores. My heavens, what if one of them is painted black? Instantly, I dismissed the absurd thought, for the smuggler would not be cruising in company. Premonition brought immediate action, less sickening uncertainty gained ascendancy. I leapt down into the crevice and snatched together the few ragged possessions. I'd hurry to the peak, sling the blanket to the bamboo flagpole, and run down to tell Charlie. That blanket flag would be visible for miles, and if the vessels came quite close, they must see me, too, signaling beside it. If only they came to anchor as close as Coquet, they could not fail to see a man signaling from the peak just across on Hawick Island. The tide was still going out as I splashed along the reef in wild delight. This thing must be really true. Yes, from halfway up the peak, those three tiny sails were plainly visible, heading this way. This was their tack for certainty, but unless the wind freshened, it would be night before they could arrive here. The tide would soon be right out. Charlie would go fishing. The flagpole could wait. I ran down the peak to Charlie's camp. He was just banking up his fire, his fish spear nearby. He was a bundle of rags. His hair had grown prodigiously. His beard was a fright. Charlie, Charlie, boats are coming, three of them. They're tacking straight for the island. He straightened up and stared from bloodshot eyes. He was morose again. Which way are they coming, he growled. Around Cape Melville South, three of them in line, purling tuggers. Luggers. There's hardly any wind, but they're tacking direct this way. They'll make okay a night anchorage, I'm certain. No need to get excited. They're not here yet. No, but they will be. I've rolled up my swag and taken it to the peak. I'm going to build up that cairn of rocks and plant that flag as high as it can possibly go. If they can't see it from 180 odd feet above the sea, they'll never see it. Granted, but it will give me something to do. A man would go mad waiting. Roll up your things and come with me. There is no need to go fishing today. I picked up the spear. There won't be, they won't be here until evening if they come here at all. I'm not going without fish just because you see a sail. There will be plenty of time after dinner. He slouched away towards the mangroves while I hurried back to climb the peak. Charlie was right about there being plenty of time, but I just couldn't go fishing today. The sails were still in sight, like white handkerchiefs on edge upon a sparkling sea, calm as a pond. It was a pleasant labor, carrying stones to build that already highly built cairn. I toiled until midday with many a glance towards the sails. To the southwest, Big Lizard Island was very plain. Northwest, a distinct pencil outline of ranges indicated the mainland. I set the flagpole up, placing its butt solidly down between the rocks. 
As the blanket unfurled, a great weight dragged the pole from my hands. In surprise, I looked to the sea. Throughout some hours of sweating labor, I had felt no breath of wind, but now from out towards the Great Barrier, rollers were coming in over a nearly flat sea. As I stared, a strong breeze came, bowing, bowing the grass to the hillside. The mangrove tops sighed tremulously in the forest below. Those three sails were billowing considerably closer, and the light I battled with the long pole. It took twenty minutes of struggle to get the big flag firmly planted in the teeth of a tearing wind. The blanket stood out taut, a square black patch high above the peak. There was no doubt about the sails now. They were tacking straight for the narrow channel and coquet. The anchor this evening at okay, for cer certainty, I laughed. Oh, if they only will. As the tide came in, Charlie appeared away below at his camp, lighting up his fire to cook his fish. He stared up at the flag. I waved, but was too excited to go down and eat. Late in the afternoon, breakers were smashing on the reef, and the sea line was whipped into a crescent of lathering foam. My heart was sick. If this wind kept up, they might not dare attempt to land a dinghy. To banish such thoughts, I hurried down the peak to Charlie. They're coming, Charlie. Come for cer coming for certainty. The three vessels will soon make the channel. They must see me as well as the signal. They cannot miss us this time. Pack up your things and be ready when they send a dinghy ashore. I'm not going to leave the island. The words took my breath away, but he meant them. Don't be a fool, man. There may not be another chance to get away from this wretched place for months and months and it's blowing up rough, we'll have to be ready when they send a dinghy ashore. Come on. You're wasting your time, he replied stubbornly. I won't leave. And what the blazes do you think is going to happen to the Wolfram? What Wolfram? Why, the tin and Wolfram we've stacked here, nearly a ton of it. Do you think I'm going to leave a hundred pounds behind? Good heavens, Charlie. It's impossible for them to take off that Wolfram. Listen to the breakers on the reef. I'm near it I'm nearly howling like a school kid at the very thought that it may be too rough for them even to send the dinghy ashore for us. Never mind the wretched Wolfram. I don't want it. All I want is to see Cooktown again. It has cost us far more than a miserable hundred pounds to get it. More than six long months in this wretched place. And if we stayed here just because of the Wolfram it would cost us another six months before we could get it transported to Cooktown. If you want the wretched stuff, you can easily arrange for one of the Cooktown luggers to pick it up first calm weather she's passing this way, but you'll have to get to Cooktown to do it. I'm not going to tell you, can't you understand, that I'm quite satisfied to live here. Go yourself while you have the chance. I'm going, Charlie. You'll be all alone. It will be awful here alone. Why the blazes should be awful alone? I've lived alone for years and never noticed. It. Anyway, now that you've made up your mind to go, what are you going to do with your papers? What papers? Your mining lease, your half share in the island. You mean our mining rights to the island? Yes. I'm going to do nothing with them, of course. The island is not of the faintest interest to me. I don't care a tinker's cuss what becomes of it and its mining rights. All I want is to get away from the place. Will you transfer your half right to me then? And now I realize Charlie was quite in his right mind. He wanted the island not only by right of possession, but officially I sat down beside him. The papers are in your own camp, Charlie. As far as I know, I have never given them a moment's thought. If you haven't got them, I don't know where they are. Your papers are are with mine. What do you want me to do then? Transfer my half right to you. Yes, but only if you don't want it. Give me the papers. He walked into his camp and came back with the papers all neatly tied up. They were only the usual blue forms of the mining rights, but perfectly binding legally. From somewhere he produced ink and pen. Quickly I transferred my half share to him and handed him the signed transfer. Satisfied? Thanks. The island is no good to you, but I want it. This gives me sole possession. 
It would be good of you, though, if you could find time and cook down to stroll into the warden's office and notify them there. Certainly I will. That will be no trouble. Thanks. Carefully he rolled and tied up the papers as I stood up to hurry back to the peak. Well, Charlie, I'm going to stand up on that peak until it's time to run down to the reef and into the dinghy. I'm positive they'll send a dinghy ashore. I'm leaving the island for good. If you've absolutely made up your mind, so long, so long, he said, and stood up and held out his hand. We shook hands, as I said. I'll tell you them that you're remaining on the island and that you want stores when I get to Cooktown and that you want the wolf from shipped back. Perhaps the catch may be in port. If so, she could land you stores on her next trip. Anyway, the storekeeper will arrange with the skipper when he does arrive. All right, if you like, but I don't care. Tell the catch to call if you see the skipper, but by that time, I'll know exactly what I'm going to do. Most likely, I'll send the wolf from to cook down with him, and he can bring me back supplies and things I want on his next trip north. I'll write the storekeeper care of the skipper to give you your share. Keep it, Charlie. I'm taking not the faintest interest in the stuff. I don't want even to hear of it again. Goodbye. Goodbye. And I hurried back to the peak. I was almost knocked flat by the wind. The mass of tumbling waters filled me with dismay. The two leading cutters were at the mouth of the channel, pitching and rolling like matches in a cauldron. Toward sundown, the nearest lugger was cleaving up the passage between the two islands. Energetically, I waved the remnant of my trousers. The lugger, driving along with wild speed, drew level with the peak. To tack away suddenly, and like a wind-blown seagull, race for anchorage and shelter of Koke Island. I nearly cried. A puff of white smoke suddenly leapt from the stern of the lugger. The wind drowned all sound, but they had fired a shot. I pranced on the peak. They had seen me. But by morning, no dinghy would be able to live in this rising sea. This might develop into stormy weather that would keep us keep up for weeks. I uncontrollable, in uncontrollable agitation, I ran backwards and forwards along the tip of the peak, waving those trousers. Scudding clouds raced low to the rising sea. The second lugger came with her decks awash, drew level with the peak, then she too slewed away, swiftly slipping over beside her mate at Koke Island. With sickening heart, I peered through the gathering gloom at the third lugger, only now entering the channel mouth. It would soon be too dark, even if they were game to launch a boat. The wind was whistling chilly too. Ceaselessly waving the signal, I stared down through the spume at the swiftly approaching lugger. She seemed flying as she approached within 100 yards of the reef and sped along beside it. Frantically, I yelled and watched the waves breaking against her bow to scour her decks and fall away and foam at her stern. She rose to a great wave and I saw a cluster of little figures clinging about her bows and crouching someone up in the rigging. They were gazing up. I snatched at the bamboo pole, tore away the blanket, threw my few things into it, snatched the spear and raced downhill to the reef. The lugger was already level. I jumped straight at the foam splashed reef and with waving arms tried to fight my way out. As a dinghy, like a toy cork, was dropped from the stern, the lugger raced into the quickening darkness. The dinghy disappeared. She reappeared, like tossing like a fly in a butter churn. Suddenly, I realized how high the waves really were. Just out past the reef, they were black green, rolling in to bulge up as they hit the shallow water now on the reef and come sweeping straight into the mangroves. Stuck, struck. On the chest, I was rolled back over the coral, but leapt up, and yelling, plunged out again. It was dark, wind and spume and flying coral sand were blinding, and filled my yelling mouth as I struggled to gain deeper water and keep a foothold there. Shadowy arms suddenly jerked me into a dinghy that was tossing in a mad effort to break free of all control.